I welcome all of you again uh, to this lecture series in aerodynamics. So in the previous class, we understood the different types of airfoils, uh, airfoil nomenclature, that is NACA airfoil series, four digit series, five digit series, and six series. So we understood uh, what each digit represents in each of these uh, airfoil series. I hope all of you understood that. Uh, if you have uh, not seen that uh, lecture, please go uh, to the previous lecture and watch it and then come back. Because in uh, today's lecture, we are going to solve few problems that are related to uh, these 4, 5 and 6 series. So we will start with uh, the flow separation. What is flow separation and why it happens? right? If a flow gets separated from the surface, that is called as flow separation. There are various reasons why it happens. Now, coming to the airfoil aerodynamics, let's assume the airfoil is kept at zero degree angle of attack. For uh, our analysis, we have considered a cambered airfoil. Right? As we discussed in earlier lecture, for a cambered airfoil, the coefficient of lift exists even at zero angle of attack. Right? As you can see from the graph, the coefficient of lift, a finite coefficient of lift exists even if the angle of attack is zero. Right? So this coefficient of lift is called as zero angle of attack coefficient of lift. Now, as you can see, at point one, let's say the angle of attack is around five degrees. The flow of the air on the upper surface is accelerated maybe up to uh, around 40% uh, of the chord length. Whereas flow on the lower surface almost remains the same as the free stream velocity. Right? But if you see the trailing edge, there is no flow getting separated from the surface. Right? That is because the layer above the airfoil surface has got enough energy to overcome the friction of the surface until it reaches the trailing edge, right? So where the energy is spent? The energy is spent by the layer just adjacent to the airfoil surface in overcoming the frictional forces on the surface. More smooth the surface, less will be the frictional force, right? So at point one, the flow is not getting separated. Instead, the flow is attached to the surface until it leaves the airfoil surface, correct? So very interesting concept here. Now, if I keep on increasing the angle of attack, let's say seven, nine, 10, 12, and for a typical cambered airfoil, let's say around 15 degrees, the coefficient of lift, or if in other words, the flow starts getting separated. Now, what is the reason for this? As the angle of attack increases, the flow that takes the curve on the upper surface increases. In other words, the flow gets accelerated more and more as I increase the angle of attack in the leading edge. But at the same time, the energy is spent in making that curve. So the air layer has to spend more energy in making a curve on the upper surface up to 40% uh, percent of the chord length. So it will uh, very fast lose its energy by the time it reaches, let's say, 50% uh, of the chord. So what happens then? The moment the air layer loses all its energy, it, is, it has no more energy to overcome the friction of the surface. So what is the eventual solution? The flow just leaves the surface. That is, that is because it has got no energy left to overcome the friction. So this phenomena is called as flow separation. Right? And it happens at an angle of attack called as the stalling angle at which the coefficient of lift will be maximum. So if you see the point two in graph, that is far beyond the stalling angle. 
where you see the flow is getting separated from the upper surface as early as 20% of the car. That is because more the curvature, the energy spent by the layer which is adjacent to the surface is more, it will lose its energy very fast and it will get separated. Now the best example I gave uh, for my students to understand the flow separation or the losing of energy or the rate of dissipation of energy is in Olympics you might have seen there is 100 meter also there is 10 kilometer run right so in both the people who participate in both the events they have different physique they have different diet and finally they have different rate of dissipation of energy for example just to increase your curiosity can Usian Bolt, who is currently the fastest man on earth, participate in 10 km race and win? You can pause the video and answer in the comment section below. What do you think? Now the answer is obviously no, not possible. Because his rate of dissipation of energy is much much high when he runs at 35-40 km per hour in 100 meter race. The same speed he cannot maintain for 10 km because the energy available is constant. In both Usian Bolt and the Ethiopian runner who runs 10 km, their both, their physical body structure is different. A 10 km runner, you see, he will be very thin, very short guy who dissipates his energy at a very small rate for a very long period of time. Whereas if you consider Russian boat, he dissipates energy faster. Right? In 100 meters he exhausts all his energy. Except some energy will be saved uh, to celebrate his victory. Right? So same uh, phenomena here are also. The moment air layer adjacent to the surface loses all its energy it can no longer stick to the surface it has to leave the surface there is no other option so this phenomena is called as flow separation the moment another point here you have to observe is the moment air leaves the surface there becomes a void region near the trailing edge where no air exists Right? No air exists means pressure will be minimum and the free stream pressure is much more compared to that void region. So what happens? All the air tries to fill up the void. So this is called as wake phenomena and that region is called as wake region. High pressure air enters into this wake region and disrupts the air flow over the upper surface. So giving concluding remarks about this uh, particular graph, for a cambered airfoil, as you keep on increasing the angle of attack, the coefficient of lift keep on increases. At certain angle of attack, the flow gets separated from the surface, which creates wake region, or in other words, which stops the coefficient of lift by increasing. So that is the maximum coefficient of lift you can reach at stalling angle beyond which if you keep on increasing the angle of attack the coefficient of lift decreases. Moving on to see the effect of uh, flow separation on the generation of lift and drag. Now as aerodynamicist your job is to reduce the drag and increase the lift as much as possible for the normal operating range of the airfoil. What do you mean by normal operating range? Let's say for cambered airfoil, the normal operating range would be uh, minus 2 degrees to 15 degrees angle of attack. right? So for a symmetric airfoil, the operating range may be from minus 15 to uh, plus 15. The symmetric airfoil is used in applications such as aerobatic steam, 
so which requires the inverted flight to give the same performance as it gives when it flies in steady level flight right so that is the application of symmetric airfoil so uh, the purpose is to increase the lift and reduce the drag but if you see this uh, diagram how the flow separation is affecting the lift and drag you see dotted line represents the attached flow whereas the solid line represents the separated flow right so you see the dotted line lift is much much higher than the solid line which is when the flow is attached and unlike lift drag the attached flow drag is much much less than the separated flow drag right so in other words the flow separation results in increasing drag which is not uh, a good sign of an airfoil so the purpose is to increase the stalling angle so we have so many other uh, options to increase the stalling angle let's say for example using of flaps during takeoff and landing it results in you know delaying the flow separation right there are so many high lift devices where you can increase the angle of attack up to 20 25 degrees using these high lift devices anyway those part i will cover in a separate lecture so to understand when the flow gets separated lift reduces and drag increases moving on to the wing plan form geometry so there are two types of wings basically a finite wing or a 3d wing and a 2d wing right so what is the difference between these two as the name itself tells a finite wing is having a finite span whereas an infinite wing is having an infinite span now how is it possible practically right you can pause the video right now think about it how it is possible to build an infinite wing if you ask me is it possible yes it is possible think about it how it is possible okay hope uh, you have given some thought uh, about it now a 3d wing or a finite wing is having a finite span which we in aerodynamics we represent it by a small b it represents a span let's say uh, the span of typical wing is let's say 2 meters right so that is the distance from one wing tip to the other wing tip is nothing but the span and because the wing tip exists we call it as uh, 3d wing right so the flow takes place across the wing in all the three direction x y and z direction whereas in infinite wing that is a 2d wing the reason we call it as 2d is because the possibility of flow to flow only in two directions right so there is there can't be the third direction uh, movement of air about 2d airfoil now how to achieve this 2d airfoil uh, most of you are aware of a term called as wind tunnel now those of you know it's well and good those who don't know the wind tunnel is used to measure all the aerodynamic forces for a wing for an aircraft even for automobiles even for trucks right so a wind tunnel is used to measure all the forces and moments about these bodies right so when i test a wing in wind tunnel i am going to attach the wing tips to the wind tunnel testing walls where i am not allowing the air to move in the third direction now that wing is an example of an infinite wing where the air cannot experience the movement in third direction whereas when you compare it with the 3d wing usually the wing generates lift due to the pressure difference and pressure difference is the result of a velocity variation right and velocity variation is the result of camber of the airfoil right now the pressure difference means on the upper surface the pressure should be minimum and on the lower surface pressure should be high compared to the upper surface now in nature all the particles moves from on its own from higher energy level to lower energy level now in this case below the wing pressure is high on the upper surface the pressure is low the wing moves from high pressure region to low pressure region right this is how lift gets generated now in this process what happens 
if the tip exists then below is high pressure air and on the top we have low pressure air so what happens if the tip is that the high pressure air tries to move towards the low pressure region right so this is called as this continuously if it generates it results in something called as wing tip vortices right we will discuss what it is in the coming slides so because of this difference the air tries to move from lower surface to upper surface at the tip experience in the third direction right so this is a difference between a finite wing and an infinite wing now both are possible as you understood finite wing all practical aircraft wings are finite wings whereas the testing wing what we use in wind tunnels those are all crudy wings now another important concept in wing geometry is something called as the aspect ratio aspect ratio is the ratio of square of span to the planform area let's say in this particular example uh, this diagram is taken from uh, nasa's website so here they have considered the span as small b and the chord as c and the planform area that is the wing area as capital s also they have shown the leading edge and the trailing edge towards the right you have an airfoil that is a cambered airfoil uh, why i call it as a cambered airfoil because the main camber line and chord line are not same in symmetric airfoil the mean chord line and the chord line coincides with each other whereas in cambered airfoil they do not coincide with each other right so that is why it is a cambered airfoil right so the definition of aspect ratio is the square of the span so do not confuse span with s right always uh, span is considered as is given a notation of b that is small b whereas the wing area is given a notation of s right so do not get confused with the wing area and span span is b and wing area is s so the aspect ratio is nothing but in the numerator we have the square of span so whatever be the span you square that value that is in the numerator and in the denominator you have the planform area s of course if you see the dimensions of this they both get cancelled the dimension of span is meter and its square is meter square and the dimension of planform area is meter square so meter square by meter square gets cancelled so aspect ratio is a dimensionless number right so when i say the wing planform area can be given as span into the standard mean chord right why i say standard mean chord is the chord what you are seeing on the screen is a typical rectangular uh, wing right so where its chord remains constant from tip to the root of the wing there are many cases and most of the modern aircraft passenger aircraft military aircraft the chord doesn't remain same from root to the tip so we have tapered uh, wings we have delta wings we have sweep back wings lot of different types of wings we have elliptical wings so in all the cases the chord is not constant so that is why we have introduced a new term that is a standard mean chord to understand what aspect ratio is right so if i simplify this i can get the aspect ratio as the ratio of span to the standard mean chord right so when i say high aspect ratio wing which means its span is much much high compared to its chord on the other hand when i say low aspect ratio the span of the wing is less compared to the chord right higher aspect ratio low aspect ratio wings